industry inside a nutshell. The show where we sail into our port of call discussing maritime history. In previous videos, we looked into interior designing and the vestules in the Olympic class liners. This includes the Britannic's doors and the items that were retrieved on the RMS Olympic following her scrapping in the 1930s. But when it comes to other designs, before they were scrapped or they sank, what would they like? Well, this answer is going to be covered in one section, which is of course the promenade decks. When it comes to designing ships, some details are introduced for marketed advertising and to have passengers come to stay aboard their ships. It was no different in the early 1900s when shipbuilding opened its doors to introduce luxury and comfort to first and second class passengers. One of the introductions to luxury and comfort, or the path to get to the rooms that provide them, was the promenade deck. Like today's modern ships, promenade decks on the Olympic, Titanic and Britannic were open air upper decks where passengers could walk outside and around the ships. They would have also been the way to go to the cabins, palm courts, lounges, smoking, reading and writing rooms. Their promenade decks were only used for first and second class passengers and were located on A, B and C decks. The decks would have been at 166 meters or 546 feet. But sometimes the measurements would have been wider it depended on the designs, but since the Olympic class liners were intended to outrival other shipping companies, White Star was determined to make their liners bigger than each other. Before we get into the differences and similarities between the sisters, we need to go back to the beginning when the ships were constructed. In 1907, a plan had been put into action when the League of Gentlemen had requested a team of shipbuilders at Harland and Wolfe to design a new trio of liners. They hoped that with these designs, they would outrival the Cunard line by basing their new liners on comfort and luxury instead of speed. Designs for the liners had begun when the designer Alexandra Carlyle and White Star Liners chairman Bruce Ismay planned to build the biggest ocean liners in the world. With Carlyle leading the project, everyone hoped that Titanic, Olympic and Britannic would be a success. In July 1908, a party of four directors presented a detailed blueprint for the Olympic class liners before they would be constructed at the Harland and Wolf shipyard. The blueprint would become known as Design D, as you can see in this drawing by Victor Valla. Although Design D would become the laying foundation of the Olympic, Titanic and Britannic, Carlyle retired from his position and from 1910 to 1911, Thomas Andrews would oversee the final construction of the Olympic and Titanic. If you would like to know more about Design D, there is a video about the topic by Mike Brady on his channel Ocean Liner Designs. A link will be replaced in the description box. When focusing on them, Bruce Ismay proposed that enclosed promenade decks would be introduced in gross tonnage calculations. However, the cost of enclosing decks would be expensive and White Star didn't have that kind of money as they spend most of the finances on new lifeboats, davits and bulkheads. In the end, the decks wouldn't be included in the gross tonnage calculations of all three ships. On the 16th of December that year, work on the RMS Olympic began. This continued with the Titanic in March 1909 and the Britannic in February 1911. Though Britannic's construction process was halted after the sinking of the Titanic, the process resumed after making various adjustments. 
When designing them, it was clear that the promenade decks on all three ships would be different. However, Olympic and Britannic would have a series of refits and additional adjustments over the years. Let's start by looking at the Olympic's promenade deck. In the Olympic's original promenade deck design, the ship had an open and enclosed promenade decks on A and B decks. The open promenade on A deck was framed after White Star received complaints of spray and wind during her first voyages. Another part of the promenade deck was that the second class areas had a longer promenade deck and the reading and writing rooms had more space, as did the first class restaurant which was centred in the middle. Olympic also had oval skid lights on A deck which provided natural illumination. After the Titanic disaster, the Olympic had varieties of safety features, but she also had refits that would become identical to Titanic's rooms. This included the addition of the Café Parisien on the starboard side. The a la carte restaurant had been extended to the port side. B deck suites were added forward of the grand staircase and the reading and writing rooms were made smaller to add more state rooms. Some of the forward first-class promenades were converted into first-class cabins, and her B-deck window arrangement evolved. In 1928, Olympic had another refit when the suites forward on B-deck were extended on both sides. When the Titanic was on her maiden voyage, it was noted that she closely resembled the Olympic. However, the differences between the sister ships were that the Titanic didn't have a B promenade deck and on A deck, her promenade deck had an enclosed space. Because of this, she had more space at a length of 169 metres, 3 inches longer than the Olympic. On A deck, the promenade was enclosed against outside weather and her skid lights were round. But the key distinguishing feature was her enclosed forward promenade deck, which was installed as protection against spray and wind and to reinforce a part of the ship prone to heavy vibration. Inside, there was additional space and with this space, the Titanic had extra first-class cabins, including four private parlour suites. These suites would have been on B and C decks, and like the ones on the Olympic, the Titanic would have two deluxe suites on B deck with a private promenade deck. The private decks would have been like the modern-day greenhouse, where passengers could sit in deck chairs and be surrounded by potted plants. These would be where the passengers would play games, read or have private meals including afternoon tea. These suites would have been occupied by J. Bruce Ismay and the Cardenza family. When the Britannic had her launch in 1914, her timing couldn't have been worse. The First World War broke out and passenger liners were either being requisitioned into troop or hospital ships or have been laid up and forgotten. Britannic was requisitioned into a hospital ship, but her promenade deck had additional space that was used to place hospital beds for wounded soldiers. It's understood that Britannic's width had been increased in her earlier designs, but the width design did allow for the double hull and extra deck space for the gantry davits. She had an open promenade or forward B deck promenade, both on her port and starboard sides. Her forward half of the promenade deck has different windows because of an extension of the suites and private promenades. The only part that's missing was a Café Parisian. Britannic never had one. However, she did have a children's playroom aft of the grand staircase and along the port side. However, the playroom was used as a storage room during the First World War. And that brings the conclusion to all three Olympic-class liners. 
Although Titanic and Britannic never got the chance to continue their use of their promenade decks, the Olympics deck had many refits to make them similar to her sisters. One can imagine how grand they must have been, especially with the entrances to the cafes, restaurants, lounges and rooms. Which Olympic class liner would you have travelled on? Share your thoughts in the comments section down below. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe for future videos. Until next time, this has been History Inside a Nutshell, departing from the dogs. Thank you so much for all of your support and enjoy the rest of your voyage.